This is the notes for section 2.3 on converses. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you read section 2.3 before going on with the notes. Uh, the big idea here for section 2.3 is that every conditional statement has a converse found by switching the antecedent and the consequent, and the converse may or may not be true even if the conditional is true. So let's, let's start with defining a converse. If we take an initial conditional, which we're going to say P implies Q. And remember that means if P, then Q. Okay? The converse of that statement is to take the P and the Q and flip where they are. So the, the P, which is the antecedent in the original conditional, becomes the consequent. The Q, which is the consequent in the, addition, in the original conditional, becomes the antecedent. So P implies Q, the converse of it would be Q implies P. Okay? So let's take a look at examples one and two here. And if you might want to just take a minute or two to go back and reread examples one and two in your book. But then I'd like to go through those two examples at this time. So example one says, write the converse of the statement. If you live in Kentucky, then you live in the United States. So I'm going to take the antecedent and the consequent, and I'm going to change where they are, okay? So the antecedent is you live in Kentucky. The consequent is you live in the United States. So I'm going to flip those two around, and I'll get if you live in the United States, then you live in Kentucky. Number two says, consider this conditional statement. If x is equal to 10, then 3x is equal to 30. It says, write the converse of the statement. Well, the converse of that statement would be taking the antecedent, x equals 10, the consequent, 3x equals 30, and switching them. If I do that, I'm going to get if 3x equals 30x, then x is equal to 10. For part B, is the statement true? Well, is, is the antecedent true every single time? I'm sorry, the original statement. Is the original statement true? The answer to that is, is yes, because every time x is 10, which is only once, really, when x is 10, then 3 times 10 is equal to 30. So when the antecedent is true, the consequent is true. Is the converse true? The answer to that is yes as well, because if I were to solve this for x, the only value of x that makes that true is, that, is x equals 10. Okay, let's take a look at the truth and falsity of converses, just like we did with conditionals. Well, really, a converse is a conditional, okay? But what is, is, is something that we have to really know about the truth and falsity is that they are independent of each other when I look at a conditional and its converse. So the truth and falsity of a statement and its converse are independent of each other. In other words, just because a conditional may be as true does not mean that the converse has to be true. Okay? Let's take a look at example three as it relates to that. It says, let R equal a figure as a rectangle and let P equal a figure as a polygon. This Venn diagram shows the relationship between the figures that make R true and the figures that make P true. It says, write R implies P in words, and is R implies P true according to the Venn diagram? Okay. Well, to write R implies P in words, we don't just write R implies P. We have to write that as a conditional. So it would be if R, which is a figure is a rectangle, then P, which is it is a polygon, okay? So um, here's that in words, and then it says, is R implies P a true statement? And the answer to that is yes, because every rectangle is a polygon. Part B says, write the converse of R implies P in words, and is it true according to the Venn diagram? Okay, well the converse would be, I'm just gonna take that antecedent and consequent and switch them, so, if a figure is a polygon, then it is a rectangle. And the answer, the, the truth or falsity of that is no, it's false, because there are polygons, in, in other words, in this big circle, that are not inside this little circle. 
Okay. Therefore, all of these values outside of this little circle, but inside of the bigger circle, would represent counterexamples. And all we need is one counterexample to say that the whole thing is false. Okay, this is example number four. It says, let t be the statement the absolute value of x is greater than 10, and let n be the statement that the absolute value of x is greater than 11. It says, draw a graph of each inequality on separate number lines. So if you look on the left here, I have the absolute value of x is greater than 10. Remember, the absolute value means all the values that are greater than 10 units from 0. So that would be all the numbers that are greater than 10, and all the numbers that are less than negative 10. Okay, so that would represent the graph of that. And then the same thing would apply for the absolute value of x is greater than or equal to 11. So when I do that, um, I'm going to um, include 11 and negative 11 in my graph. Okay, part b says write t implies n. So if I'm going to write that in words, that would be if the absolute value of x is greater than 10, that's my t statement, then the absolute value of x is greater than or equal to 11. That's my n statement. Okay. Part c is if t in, if is t implies n, in other words, what we have in part b, is that true and explain? The answer is no, because if you have x equals like 10.5 or 10.3 or there's a number of counterexamples, but that would provide a counterexample because 10.5 is greater than 10, but it's not greater than 11. Okay? If we have one counterexample, then that statement is false. Okay? So we could say the statement in part B is a false statement. Okay? Part D says write the converse of the statement that you have in part B. So now I'm just going to switch the antecedent and the consequent around. So if x is greater than or equal to 11, then x is greater than 10. Okay. And is the converse true? And the answer is the converse is true because every single number that is greater than or equal to 11 or negative 11 is also greater than 10 or negative 10. Okay? A greater, uh, yeah. Uh, so if you can really see that on the graph here. All of these values would be included in these values. Okay? Okay, finally, example number five, the last example here. It says, consider the statement, if n is equal to five, then n squared minus 3n minus 10 is equal to zero. Okay? Part A says, is this a true conditional statement? Okay. The answer is yes, because when n is equal to 5, it makes this statement, the consequent, true. Because if I plug n equals 5 in here, I get 5 squared minus 3 times 5 minus 10. Well, if I work that out, that's 25 minus 15, which is 10. 10 minus 10 is 0. I get 0 equals 0. Since that's a true statement when n is 5, then this is a true, con tr true conditional. Part b says, what, what is the converse? Well, the converse would be just switching that around. So here would be the converse. And then we want to know if the converse is true. And the answer to that is no, because there's more than one solution to this quadratic. Okay? There are two solutions, in fact, when n is equal to 5 and when n is equal to 2. Okay, and that means that if n equals 2 would be a counterexample because this would be true, but this would be false. Therefore, this is not a true statement. The converse is not true.